Contagion is a 2011 classic from Steven Soderbergh starring a quite incredible cast, although a bunch of them do die. I remember it being way more realistic than other pandemic movies, but with the current uh, coronavirus craze sweeping the planet, I thought it would be quite fun to revisit. How does it stand up to scientific scrutiny? How much of the current situation did it uh, predict? Is it evidence that Gwyneth Paltrow is responsible for killing everyone? There are clearly going to be spoilers ahead, but the film is nine years old, so just deal with it. Before we begin, there is something I need. That's better. It's a live attenuated vaccine. Remember to drink in moderation or drink until you are 60% alcohol when you can actually kill the bug just on contact. Let's check it out. Now, much of the inspiration for the movie came from the 2002 to 2003 SARS outbreak. So it's no surprise that the film starts with the, the virus coming from China. But as you see, it rapidly spreads to London. Damn it. Don't worry, I'm ready. Mm, Gwyneth's feeling a bit peaky here. Maybe too many vaginal steams. All right, actually, I don't think she's well at all. Oh, ooh. Quick, Matt, you better call the goop ambulance. This lady needs an urgent bath bomb and a medium to talk to her dead relatives. Oh no, I, I think she can talk to them directly herself. You want me to um, take a sample? Or? Yeah, I want you to move away from the table. Should I call someone? Call everyone. Okay, this is uh, Gwyneth's character's post-mortem. So the pathologists have opened her skull and are looking at her brain. Clearly they've seen something abnormal. We know that the doctor earlier mentioned encephalitis, um, which is inflammation of the brain tissue, swelling of the brain. And this is because the MEV1 virus, which is fictional in the movie, is based on a real virus, the Nipah virus, which has had outbreaks in Malaysia, Bangladesh, and India over the last 20 years or so. And it's particularly nasty. And it is, uh, and a feature of it is causing neurological involvement, such as this encephalitis, which is different to coronavirus. Now the current um, SARS-CoV-2 virus that we're dealing with has got a fatality rate of about 3% at the time of making this video. The Nipah virus had a fatality rate of 50 to 75%, which is really scary, but it's much less infectious. Uh, coronavirus is highly infectious, but much less deadly. Thankfully, we haven't had to deal with a combination of very deadly and very infectious so far. Okay, this is worth pointing out. It's only day five in the movie, and the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and the WHO, World Health Organization, are already in talks about this new outbreak. For COVID-19, our current infection, um, that didn't happen until much later. And the reason being is that MEV1, the fictional virus, provokes symptoms almost straight away, which is pretty unrealistic. Most bugs take at least a few days of what's called incubation. What we are hearing from Beijing is that the outbreak is contained to the chrysanthemum complex in Hong Kong. Two deaths and 10 suspected cases. I'm guessing this is a reference to the Amoy Gardens building complex in Hong Kong, which is where hundreds of cases of SARS were diagnosed in the early stage of the outbreak and the whole building was put into lockdown. What's your single overriding communications objective? We're isolating the sick and quarantining those who we believe were exposed. While the reality of the fight against killer diseases is much more of a team pursuit, you don't necessarily have these individuals doing all the work, Kate Winslet's character is based on a real life person, an Italian microbiologist called Carlo Urbani, who was the first to identify the, the SARS um, virus in 2003 and raise the alarm, which allowed the WHO to escalate and take action to bring the infection to an end. But, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about him uh, later on. And of course, uh, with the uh, SARS-CoV-2, there is uh, Dr. Li Wenliang, who again was a whistleblower early on and trying to, to raise the alarm about how severe the infection was. And tragically, he fell victim to the virus and also to the, the sluggish response of the Chinese authorities. So at this point, I think we have to believe this is respiratory, maybe fomites too. What's that, fomites? Uh, it refers to transmission from surfaces. Nice. The average person touches their face two or 3,000 times a day. For every person who gets sick, how many other people are they likely to infect? So for seasonal flu, that's usually about one. Smallpox, on the other hand, it's over three. Now, before we had a vaccine, polio spread at a rate 
between four and six. Now, we call that number the R naught. Any ideas what that might be for this? How fast it multiplies depends on a variety of factors. The incubation period, how long a person is contagious. Sometimes people can be contagious without even having symptoms. This is completely right. We're seeing quite a few cases of people testing positive for the virus with no symptoms whatsoever, which is important because that means that they will spread the disease without knowing. It's pleomorphic, but tends toward ovoid in shape. In this context, pleomorphism implies that the individual virions can have different shapes, different morphologies. Here is a model of the virus and how it attaches to its host. The blue is virus and the gold is human and the red is the viral attachment protein and the green is its receptor in the human cells. These receptors are found in the cells of both uh, the respiratory tract and the central nervous system. And the virus attaches to the cell like a key slipping into a lock. This bit's really nice. For all coronaviruses, there is a component of its makeup called a spike protein, which is indeed what's responsible for the crown or corona-like appearance of the virus under electron microscopy. For SARS-CoV-2, a defined receptor binding domain on the spike protein mediates the attachment of the virus to its cellular receptor, in this case, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, or ACE2, and this is indeed a point of interest for researchers looking for a way to combat SARS-CoV-2. Big sequences in the bottom right, you can see the dark green is pig and the light green is bat, and here you can see the crossover event. Uh, they're actually normally called spillover events. Somewhere in the world, the wrong pig met up with the wrong bat. I knew Tinder introducing interspecies dating would be a mistake. So we have a novel virus with a mortality rate in the low 20s. No treatment protocol and no vaccine at this time. That is a mortality rate in the low 20s is realistic. It's way higher than SARS-CoV-2 at the moment. Most movies, when they depict a pandemic virus, uh, seem to imply that everybody who gets it dies, which is not realistic. From here on out, I want no one working on this except the PSL 4. Level 4 is the highest security level for um, virus research. And I guess this scene is a nice nod to the fact that finding a vaccine is not going to be down to one institution. It's going to be a collaborative effort. Because it kills every cell we put it in, a pig, chicken, everything. Until we can grow it and a great deal of it, we can't experiment with it. And until then, we can't vaccinate against it. Yes, so c continuing the fine Hollywood trope of employing English actors for exposition. Look at Elliot Gould's disgust at the human race. I feel you, Ross's dad. I feel you. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States and the World Health Organization in Switzerland confirmed today that Dr. Ian Sussman of San Francisco has succeeded in growing the MEV1 virus in a laboratory setting. Contagion is right on the money with the time frame here. In the movie, it says Mr. Geller grew the virus on day 12, which is almost the exact time that elapsed after the publication of the RNA genome online um, in January, before the first lab grew the virus successfully. You're familiar with Fasithia? No, I'm not. What I'm about to tell you is backed up by testimonials that will appear shortly in the popular media. I'll be talking about it extensively in the days ahead. What does Fasithia do? It's the cure. Jude Law's character is perhaps my favorite uh, storyline in this movie. Remember, this is back in 2011 when social media wasn't such a world-changing force that it is today. And um, his self-educated citizen blogger, um, citizen scientist person uh, is instrumental in spreading misinformation about the MEV1 virus, um, just like we're seeing on a daily basis now with SARS-CoV-2, sadly. And like uh, many of these people, he turns out to be a crank who's just trying to line his own pockets, um, like so many truth-tellers on the internet today. It's just a fantastic and very prescient storyline. Room 20 minutes earlier. Marion Cotillard's character, again, probably wouldn't have been an individual, but more like a team, but she represents the painstaking contact tracing, which is so important to what a lot of public health officials and epidemiologists do. They say the French and Americans have a cure. They're manufacturing it in secret. WHO knows, but they're in bed with the Americans. Who says? The internet. The internet, and you believe it. 
I don't know. About 50 doses today. That's our forsythia 11. Hey, excuse me, there's a line here. Excuse me. Well, I mean, this is obviously all realistic. We're seeing panic buying already, uh, especially in the, in the US. And um, the scenes of people rioting in a pharmacy to get the last remaining supplies, well, your guess is as good as mine about how realistic that is. But I find if you generally assume the worst about human nature, more often than not, you're correct. Ah, oh, well, that fetching little outfit has come true. Poor Kate. Her character is representative of the huge toll taken on healthcare professionals uh, who deal with these outbreaks. When researching these coronavirus videos, it was really sobering to read about how many healthcare professionals have given their lives fighting against these killer diseases. The Italian microbiologist I mentioned earlier, uh, Carlo Urbani, who um, inspired Kate Winslet's character, died uh, succumbing to the disease that he identified, SARS. And uh, the other person I mentioned earlier, Li Wenliang, uh, died just a few weeks ago. So I know it's a, it's a corny film gesture of Kate Winslet handing her coat to a patient in need, but I think it really reflects the selflessness of a lot of these uh, healthcare workers. Our best defense has been social distancing. No handshaking, staying home when you're sick, washing your hands frequently. <laughs> Hey, Sanjay Gupta, he's literally just launched a podcast about coronavirus and he's been talking to people from the CDC, so the film predicted that as well. Uh, there are therapies we know are effective right now, like forsythia, and they don't even appear on the CDC website. On your blog, you also wrote that the World Health Organization is somehow in bed with pharmaceutical companies? Because they are. That's who stands to gain from this. They're working hand in glove. Sadly, we're hearing exactly this, the same anti-science mistrust of authorities that I mention in many of my videos are, is playing out exactly as we would have predicted for COVID-19. In order to become sick, you have to first come in contact with a sick person or something that they touched. In order to get scared, all you have to do is come in contact with a rumor. I just like that quote if we even had a viable vaccine right now, we would still have to do human trials and that would take weeks. And then we would have to get clearance and approval, figure out manufacturing and distribution, that would take months. And then train survivors to give inoculations, more months, more deaths. Thank you, Dr. Exposition, once again. And thank you for testing the vaccine on yourself, which is actually a proud tradition in the history of medicine. My own field of invasive cardiology was created when a junior doctor stuck a tube into his own heart. But the most famous example must be um, the Australian doctor, Barry Marshall, who I think in the 70s or 80s um, was ridiculed for suggesting that peptic ulcers, stomach ulcers were caused by an infection. So to prove his doubters wrong, he actually drank a solution of Helicobacter pylori, which we now know is the cause of peptic ulcers. And he unsurprisingly got loads of ulcers, um, but proved his point and eventually went on to win the Nobel Prize. Do you remember Dr. Barry Marshall? Thought that bacteria caused ulcers? <laughs> ah, she's just mentioned him. Well, clearly I have nothing original to add to this. The Food and Drug Administration is accelerating approval of the MEV1 vaccine currently in production at five secret locations in the US and Europe. Okay, I think this is a reasonably important criticism of the accuracy here, uh, the speed of developing a vaccine. At this point in the movie, only a few months have passed, but in reality, it's gonna take us longer than that. See my last video to find out why a vaccine takes so long. The government rushed the trials. The lawyers indemnified the drug companies. Maybe it causes autism or narcolepsy or cancer 10 years from now. No, ah, sorry, I'm not supposed to touch my face. Oh yes, let's keep SARS and H1N1 and MEV1 all in the same storage unit to maximize the danger from a coolant leak. Damn, that camera battery has lasted a long time. And yes, bats. 
We think the SARS-CoV-2 virus came from bats, much like the previous SARS outbreak, much like Nipah. And bats are a very good source of zoonotic infections, i.e. infections that cross from other animals to us, for many reasons. Number one, they live in huge numbers in very close proximity in caves and things, and they all uh, are in contact with each other. Number two, they fly, so they cover huge distances. Number three, they have quite interesting immune systems, meaning that they can be infected with the virus without being particularly affected by it, and they don't die, but they can act as a vector. And um, in countries with so-called wet markets, where you'll see all kinds of live animals mixing with each other, domestic, wild, bats, pigs, birds, all stuff rubbing shoulders, perfect breeding ground for viruses to jump between species. Uh, bats can be a, a very important vector of these viruses spreading around. The source of the 1998 Nipah outbreak in Malaysia was actually um, fruit bats eating mangoes above a pig enclosure. So they'd eat part of the mango, it would fall down, and then the pig would eat more of the mango, and they think that's how the uh, spillover event occurred. And that is contagion. Let me know if there's any bits of it you think I missed out that I should have talked about or if you've got any specific comments or questions. I think it did a pretty good job of being scientifically accurate. Obviously every movie has to take some liberties, but I think it depicted, as you can see, a lot of the stuff we're encountering at the moment and perhaps we'll run into in forthcoming months. I'm making a few videos about coronavirus on the channel. There's one that's come before this one, so do stay tuned for the rest. I'm trying to work my way through your questions, so if you've got any specific questions you want me to deal with, let me know. But for now, my vaccine has depleted, so it is time for a booster shot.